Hi, welcome to the Nazareth to Nicaea podcast and vodcast, the show where we cover the historical Jesus, the Christ of faith and everything in between with your host, Mike Bird. Well, hello there, Jonathan. It's great to have you on the Nazareth to Nicaea podcast and vodcast. Hi, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great to be here. Now, Jonathan, I'm I'm led to believe you have quite the uh, quite the collection of stamps in your passport. Uh, where are you from? Where have you been? And where are you now? So, uh, yeah, originally I'm from the U.S. I'm I'm from Arkansas, and uh, I studied at a couple of places in in the states, uh, in Oklahoma and Alabama, and then uh, yeah, moved to to New Zealand to do my PhD and was there for a while. Uh, met someone while I was there and she's Korean. And so uh, now we've moved and we live here in South Korea in Seoul. Oh, wonderful. Now, I mean, you've, you've specialized in the apostolic fathers. So can you tell us about your prior work on the apostolic fathers? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I got really interested in the apostolic fathers um, because they were just texts that I hadn't read before. Um, and then when it came time for a PhD, I found they were texts that had a smaller amount of scholarship compared to, say, Paul or John. Uh, and so it was a little bit easier to to get my head around some of the things that were being discussed. Um, so I, I just jumped in with, with Ignatius of Antioch uh, during my PhD, and I've kind of kept working from there. Uh, I, I enjoyed working with the Shepherd of Hermas and yep. the Epistle of Barnabas. Yeah, and I, I find that working with these texts like allows me to to deal with New Testament reception and similar genres. So I'm yeah. still in the early Christian world, but uh, a little bit later in the second century. That's good. And the book we're talking about today is your volume on the Christology of Ignatius of Antioch. Could you tell us briefly who was Ignatius of Antioch? Sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, Ignatius of Antioch was, um, uh, I, I think, uh, if, if you take the letters to be authentic, um, he was a uh, Syrian church leader from, from Antioch. Um, he's given the title bishop, and exactly what that means at that time is, is disputed, uh, but, um, but I'll probably refer to him as a, as a bishop. Uh, uh, and then we can define that term as we go. Um, he was arrested. Uh, we don't quite know why. And he wrote seven letters as he was being transported from Antioch to Rome, where we think he uh, most likely was killed. Okay. Well, so he was, a, uh, he was a bishop or Christian leader of some kind, author of some um, various bits of correspondence with him and churches and other Christian figures, and also celebrated as a martyr of the church. And he's he's literally doing theology on the move then, isn't he? He's literally en route to his execution when he's allegedly <laughs> writing these letters. And they're interesting. Am I right in saying they're interesting? Because as he's doing these various exhortations and warnings and instructions, things like obey the bishop, don't do anything without the bishop, don't have Eucharist without the bishop, the bishop is good, don't do anything without the bishop, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, warning about docetic heresies. Um, he, he does also almost not randomly, but seamlessly weave into another, a number of affirmations about Jesus, who Jesus is. And I guess that's, that's really what you're, you're touching on in this, in this wonderful and very, I think, uh, informative and learned book. So, I mean, can we, can we start breaking down who is Jesus according to Ignatius? I mean, if actually is one, if we were to ask Ignatius, so who is this guy, Jesus, and what has he done for you lately? Uh, what do you think would Ignatius' answer be? Yeah, um, I suspect his answer would be to give some sort of short story about who Jesus is. Um, I think one of the places where I, I try to get to fairly early in the book is to think about how stories are embedded into these letters. Um, and so I think he'd probably start with... Um, with Jesus' birth, um, per perhaps with Jesus' baptism. Uh, there might be a mention of that. Uh, uh, so yeah, the, after the baptism, 
uh, Jesus' death and resurrection uh, are, are really vital. And Ignatius spends a lot of time thinking about um, suffering and death and then the conquering of death. And then in all of this, uh, Ignatius is quite emphatic that Jesus um, is both very much an embodied and enfleshed human being. Uh, at the same time, he is God. And Ignatius just puts those words next to one another. Uh, and for those of us who, who've read a bit in the fourth century uh, or, or later church history, Ignatius doesn't do much to reconcile these two claims. He just mm. asserts them both and lets them stand side by side. Yeah. Uh, well, in, in addition to these sort of little narrative segments, um, he's also got some fairly exalted um, prose as well. Um, he's got all these, you know, and great designations, as you call him, like beloved physician, you know, things like that. He's got these, you know, fairly um, neat titles. And, and, and I think, as far as I'm aware, at least to begin with, unique to him. So he's, he's got these, his own, you know, uh, repertoire of titles, designations for Jesus. Could you talk about some of them briefly? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as Ignatius is going through, he he does refer to Jesus as as physician, um, and he he works from that to then um, explain how Jesus is is the physician, which is uh, essentially that he is both human and divine. Um, and Ignatius does this again by playing with um, events from Jesus' life. So he is born of Mary and uh, and from God. Um, I think I butchered that line slightly, but uh, something along those lines, both from Mary and from God. Uh, and um, yeah, and then he also uses some some other interesting adjectives, especially for so early in the second century. Um, he, for example, calls him unbegotten. Uh, yes. and that, that's, that's, one think... near, that's one near and dear to my heart, as you might be aware, Jonathan, uh, because right. in the end, uh, so if I if I um, riff off this for a bit, in the ancient world, there were two types of deities, the begotten deities, like someone who becomes a god, like a Heracles or a Roman Empire, Roman emperor. And then there are like the eternal forever gods who are called the unbegotten, or we could say ingenerate in other language. And he, he if I'm right, and there was an Ephesians 7, 2, I think. That's uh, right. He says Jesus is both begotten and unbegotten. And based on the symmetry, the way he employs it, you get the impression that he's begotten in his humanity, but unbegotten in his divinity, uh, which is making it a claim of absolute divinity for Jesus. Um, that's, that's, that's my reading, which I have no idea whether that's your reading of it as well, Jonathan. Yeah. But I mean, that is, he's not saying, well, he's a divine being of some form. He's saying the ultimate category of the eternal forever divine beings that is true of Jesus. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. That's, that's the claim that he's been making there. And uh, it is really startling. Uh, I, I, again, um, take the letters to be authentic and, and actually put them fairly early in the second century, but it is one reason why people like to push the date of Ignatius letters a bit later. Um, mm. and, well, I uh, mean, well, we know that the language became problematic because when he calls the son unbegotten, um, certainly, uh, I know, and this is from, and this is built on reception stuff, but when you get to Athanasius, he's got to defend Ignatius because normally you would call the father is unbegotten. The son is eternally begotten. I just, just did a video on that for those people who want to see that one. Um, and then, you know, then the spirit is, you know, proceeding. So, I mean, I, I tend to think the proof that, the, that these, this is not inauthentic made up much later is that the language Ignatius used by the fourth century would, would later be perceived as problematic since only the father's meant to be unbegotten, but he's using that language and applying it to Jesus, which I think is a, a good indication of, of the authenticity of, of that kind of language. I, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, as well, there's uh, within the Ignatian tradition, there's a need to defend Ignatius. So the long recension um, has, has two positions. Uh, mm. Ign there's there's the father who is unbegotten and there is the son who is uh, begotten that's slightly loose in my mind but there are two references to the position and, and they split over the reference which of, you can uh, see that the... that longer ascension is trying to fix the problem 
that's presented that's and what using what the middle recension using the middle recension that's, that's correct. trying to mm -hmm. fix the problem in in the middle recension which is kind of proof that i think it's dependent on the on on the on the middle version so oh, yeah i think that's, that's right. good but it's, it's interesting mm -hmm. to show how these documents do have a bit of a life story there's a reception history even in the you know early period yeah yeah they do yeah that's right I mean, what else do you think is significant, um, Jonathan, about uh, Ignatius's Christology? Um, is there anything where he was kind of, you know, groundbreaking, trendsetting? Uh, was he, I mean, we know he, he says Jesus is divine and human. He doesn't tell us how. So he doesn't go down to have a full theory of hypostatic union. But is there anything he's doing that is really going to influence others later on? Uh, or, you know, or at least steer the, the nature of the discourse about who Jesus is later? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I, I think one of the places where um, Ignatius is really interesting is in his use of images and metaphors. Um, I'm not sure if he's absolutely, well, he's not groundbreaking here uh, because other people use metaphors of Jesus too, mm. um, both before and after Ignatius. But uh, he is certainly fascinating at this point. Um, uh, he refers to I think he refers to Jesus as a star, um, and uh, and it, the way that I read that passage is that actually there's a uh, it, it's a way of describing Jesus' um, birth and the effects of Jesus' life cosmically, mm -hmm. um, and and that's a really um, intriguing claim if if I've read it right, though it's a highly disputed passage. Um, and uh, he also refers to Jesus in the light of the Old Testament, but uses some interesting language about the Old Testament at this point. He, he refers to the Old Testament as archives. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's got a weird statement. And people say, well, people, want, people don't believe stuff unless they hear it in the archives. Well, pff, my archives are Jesus. Um, which, right. which sounds a lot, it does sound like a bit like a flippant disregard for the Old Testament, doesn't it? And you can it see does. how, you can, I mean, Ignatius is not Marcion. But you can see how it's a hop, skip, and a jump to go where Marcion would be. Um, you know, there is a kind of trajectory. You can say, okay, I, I can't get there from Hebrews, but I can get there from from Ignatius. Um, yes. I, I, I guess the other thing, and this is, I guess, for me as, a, as an Anglican that I find interesting, is Ignatius is against a docetic Christology, that Jesus only appeared to be human. But he also doesn't like a docetic view of the, of the, of the Eucharist. Um, those who deny that this is the, the, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, that's also a type of docetism. Now, he doesn't tell us what type of presence he sees there, whether it's a spiritual presence or it's a transubstantiation or a consubstantiation. All those debates are happening later down the corridors of history. But I find it interesting that he, his, the, do, the docetism also applies to the presence of Christ in the elements. Um, yes. Now, I'm, I'm assuming you've got a Baptist background for yourself, Jonathan, or something along those lines. So this may not be big on your bingo card for studying um, <laughs> for studying uh, Ignatius. Uh, but I mean, that, that is interesting, the way he treats the, 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 do, the, the heresy of docetism. It is a fascinating claim. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, for Ignatius, the sacraments, uh, particularly baptism and, and the Eucharist, uh, yeah, the physicality of these things point to uh, or, or maybe derive their importance from uh, from Jesus, from Jesus' own physicality and, and embodiment. Um, and that inspire, inspires, we'll go with inspires for now. Um, it, it inspires Ignatius, uh, I think, in, in his own journey towards martyr, martyrdom. So um, he, he understands his death. And the physicality of his death in um, terms that are certainly Christological and arguably Eucharistic, um, it, it certainly moves in in that direction. So he um, he, he plays a lot with this imagery, uh, and it's it's complex and and perhaps not always the same in each letter, mm. but the physicality and the reality of, of Jesus presence in the Eucharist is, is certainly there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's definitely um, true for Ignatius. Uh, I think my favorite line from Ignatius and correct me if I'm wrong is where he says, you know, pray for me that I would not simply be called a Christian, but I would prove myself to be one. Um, 
largely with respect to how he's going to die, which you know I find I find very moving. I mean, is is there a favorite Christological part of Ignatius' letters that you really like? I mean, I obviously like a the Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter seven. Do you have a a really you know choice part of uh, his letters that that you you think are, are particularly poignant or prominent or, or or a good summary? Yeah. For me, I think it's the, uh, maybe the ending of Ephesians, where um, in at the end of chapter eighteen, uh, he refers to Jesus um, and these these three mysteries. Um, I guess that's actually in chapter nineteen. Uh, the three mysteries, but there's there's reference to Jesus, um, human events, his birth from Mary, and and eventually his death, and. Then, and there is that reference to the star, and I take that to be the cosmic effects implications of his death. And then as Ignatius gets to the end of that story, he says, there's actually more to say, and I'd love to write more about it. Um, but of course, we don't we don't have that letter uh, if, if he ever did write it. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's good. Now, Jonathan, so a final question for you. Um, your book is good, not just because it's about the Christology of one particular bishop, and martyr and letter writer, but it, it's also a bit of a window into early Christianity and how they're developing their own language, their own liturgies, their own ways of describing and celebrating who Jesus is for the church, for the world, that type of a thing. What do you think readers who, who maybe not, you know, maybe know a little bit of church history, uh, what do you think readers will take away from reading your book. So if someone really is into church history or the apostolic fathers or Ignatius himself or early Christology, what, what's something readers will take away, learn or, or better appreciate from reading your book? Yeah. Um, so I, I do hope we get, by, by reading this book, I, I hope we get a better sense of um, who Ignatius thinks Jesus is, which can then help us to think about who Jesus is. Um, the other thing that I, I hope people might notice is um, what Ignatius thought about Jesus had impacts for him and for his community and for how they lived. And so I think uh, the the close relationship between how, how early Christians and um, perhaps for those who are members of, of the Christian faith today, um, uh, for us as well. Um, but the relationship between what we believe about Jesus or what Ignatius believed about Jesus and how uh, we or Ignatius and his, mm. his audiences uh, should act or um, should, should see the world around us. I, I think that there are connections there and, and hopefully that comes out a little bit through the book. Okay, so who you think of Jesus will affect the, the type of community you have, um, what you think of leaders, leadership, the physicality of your embodied existence as a Christ believer, I guess. Yes, that's Which right. It's pretty significant yeah. stuff if you, if you get down to it. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Who, who we are as human beings. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, Jonathan, um, well, let me, let me, let me uh, restate the, uh, the name of the book again. The, the name of the book is The Christology of Ignatius of Antioch. It's published by Wipfenstock, and you can get it wherever you get your books um, online or otherwise. Uh, Jonathan, it's been a pleasure talking to you, hearing about your research on Ignatius and early Christology. Uh, take care, my friend, and we look forward to whatever it is you come up with next time. Thanks, Mike. This has been great. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that was my interview with Jonathan Lukadu on the Christology of Ignatius of Antioch. And yeah, I thought that was great. He's a great young and up and coming scholar, very, very clever, very humble. And I hope you've enjoyed that. And if you enjoy listening or watching the Nazareth Nicaea podcast and vodcast, feel free to describe, you know, either where you um, cast your line for podcasts or subscribe to the YouTube channel and you won't miss out when the next episodes come out otherwise take care uh, i hope to see you soon i've got a plan for a whole bunch of new episodes in the future on things ranging from pauline christology to talks to other scholars about their own research on the christology of early christianity until then i'll see you around the channel <laughs>